Hello? Hello? Uh, is that you, Emily? Uh, yeah, it's Emily. Is that Steve? Yeah, Steve so. Hey. Uh, there's a bunch of people here, but the meeting hasn't started yet. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Now I can. Hey. I heard both of you. This is Emily Harris. Hello? Can everyone hear me now? Anyone? I think so. Yes. Oh, boy. Hello. Hi, yeah. Okay, I have been talking apparently to no one, um, even though my uh, <laughs> my light was green. Um, I don't know what's going on, so I just uh, restarted it there. Um, so I'm I'm getting the meeting started here. I'm I'm doing roll call. I've got um, myself. I've got Michael Crone. Um, we have Adam who's joined us. Um, Emily, Steve. Do we have Les on the phone? No less. Uh, Scott and Rob, we're, we're going to be late. Do we have either Scott or Rob? Okay. We have Mark. We have Tony. Do we have Sharon? No, Sharon. Uh, we do not need Ginger for this one because we are not discussing recruitment today. We have Senator Thatcher on the phone. Do we have Representative Power on the phone? Oh, hi, Sharon. Thank you for typing in the chat. No representative power. Okay. Do we have Todd Albert? Present. Hi, Todd. Thank you for joining us. Hi, glad you, I'm glad you can hear me now. <laughs> um, so <laughs> me too. I thought it was me. Oh, boy. Um, can we get someone to please um, move to approve the agenda for today? Hi, this is Tony so moved. Thank you, Tony. Can I get a second? I'll second it. Oh, thank you, Steve. Um, so all those in favor of approving the agenda? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. No opposed. Okay. So we will move right into our first item here. Um, we have Todd Albert joining us today for our acting advocate update. Um, we had a few items that council members requested 
um, in our previous meeting to get updates on. And um, those items were a report out about Sunshine Week um, was one of the first items. So Todd, if you want to talk about Sunshine Week, that would be great. Absolutely. So as you all are probably aware, Sunshine Week is an annual effort begun some time ago by a group of reporters in Florida uh, to, to spotlight open government and access to information and transparency issues generally. And there's a lot of different ways that that can be celebrated. And Ginger, when she came into the office, definitely wanted to make sure that, that was something we did in Oregon to just kind of highlight particularly important issues and events during Sunshine Week. And so last year was our first attempt at that. And what we were able to do in the time that we had was uh, post a gallery of stories that were made possible by uh, public records uh, that, you know, that couldn't have happened without public records. And it was very well received and highly successful. And another idea we had was providing awards or giving awards to public employees who went above and beyond, who really exceeded expectations in fulfilling public records requests. And so uh, we solicited suggestions, uh, received a number of uh, nominations and ultimately awarded, I think, 11 public employees these awards, just uh, recognizing what they did in fulfilling public records requests. And we were lucky enough last year to have the participation of the governor's office and Governor Kate Brown actually signed letters of awards to each of these individuals. So of course, I want to make uh, Sunshine Week an annual occurrence and uh, do something every year. And my goal was to try to expand what we did during Sunshine Week a little bit. And so I certainly wanted to keep the awards going because I think well, one, I think was really meaningful to the individuals who received it. And two, so much of the work that I do is focusing on when things aren't working under the public records law and trying to correct those errors and kind of work with people throughout the state to change the conversation about public records that I think it's important to have these awards to show when things do work, when individual employees even suffering the constraints that they have within their public bodies are still capable of doing exceptional work in fulfilling public records requests. So uh, once again, I solicited nominations and received a number of them from uh, members of the public and media, as well as public bodies, and ultimately was able to award seven individuals with uh, Sunshine Week awards uh, from DHS, PERS, the Oregon Health Authority, the Oregon State Bar, Amity, Oregon, and the University of Oregon Police Department. And what I found really interesting about doing it this year, um, because I saw 100% of the information that came in and fielded 100% of the questions about it this year as opposed to last year. And one thing that really struck me about this was how many nominations came in from public bodies themselves wanting to nominate their ind individuals or units, which I think is really important. I think it represents a buy-in from government that they see um, they see value in this. They see value in putting forward employees who have really kind of got, gone above and beyond. And I hope, you know, that, can that, that helps continue to forward the message or put forward the message of the primacy of the public records law, because, of course, so often yeah. it seems like it can almost be an afterthought for some public bodies, simply because a lot of, like, how to respond to public records requests isn't necessarily baked into a lot of systems. And so I like that we're getting more government investment in this program. Because, again, I just I think it's bringing more people to the table and wanting and they're wanting to do good work and have it highlighted. So I like I like that we got so many nominations from public bodies. That being said, I'm working very hard to keep the awards specific to actual like recognizable acts of public employees. So while I agree that perhaps an entire public records unit like answered an amazing number of public records requests within a year uh, or things like that, I like to focus on specific acts because I want to make sure that the program is in insulated from as much criticism as possible and sustainable for as long as possible by really dialing in on what happened in a particular instance. And so the awards are specific to individual acts by these, uh, by these public employees. So that was a major part of this year's uh, Sunshine Week and really the truly most successful part of it because of course all this occurred right as we were going into lockdown thanks to COVID-19. 
So the other big thing that I was going to do this year that was new was have a public records panel where uh, the five panelists, two members of the media, of course, uh, from our own PRAC, as well as three uh, state employees, we're going to answer we're going to answer six questions derived from my general PowerPoint training that I give to public bodies. That's about 90 minutes long. And instead of me standing up there and doing my 90 minute PowerPoint presentation, they were, they were going to answer questions from this presentation with an audience where we had, I think, maxed out attendance at the unemployment auditorium at the point that this had to be canceled. So we were going to have 145 people from various state governments uh, or from various parts of our state government come in and be a live audience and participate in this panel discussion. So that was something I was very excited about that, of course, we then had to cancel, but I'm looking forward to trying to reschedule later in the year. It was going to be recorded, and it was going to be made available through the Advocates website, through YouTube, and through iLearn so that anyone down the road can continue to access it. And uh, the only other thing that was happening in Sunshine Week is that uh, I made sure everyone knew that I have continued the gallery of stories made either made possible by public records or are about the public records law in Oregon. Because for last year, uh, with Ginger's idea, we had it as stories that we gathered to present that week. But I'm maintaining an, a running gallery on the website that anyone can go to anytime and see the stories that I've managed to notice and make available. So that's it about Sunshine Week. I'm happy to answer any questions before we move on to the next topic. Or if you want to lob some suggestions at me for next year, please feel free to do so now or touch base with, touch base with me another time. Uh, Todd, this is Tony. I've got a question. Um, are the, uh, the specific acts and the, the, the above and beyond stories of um, the employees, are they summarized anywhere um, um, for the public to see? Like just like yeah. what, what they did? Yes, yes, they are. So I did put out a notice to the listserv uh, that, you know, reaches some people. I think I tweeted about it, but then on the website, all that connects to the Sunshine Week section of the website that then has the release I drafted that summarizes, uh, you know, it says who the recipients are and summarizes their acts and actually I think even has a PDF of each of their awards because we went a little above and beyond this year too, speaking of which, by instead of just giving them a letter, the governor's office was unable to participate this year. I actually worked with uh, archive staff to draft or create an actual certificate, and they did an amazing job. So now signed by me, not the governor, but it just looks really nice, and I hope people will put those up. So yeah, that's all on the website under the Sunshine Week page. Yeah, I think I think it's really great to, um, and I'm glad to hear that you're you're, you're uh, you use social media to promote it. I, I, I encourage you to just keep doing it. Uh, rep it uh, repeatedly um, on like not just once because I think I don't know what the specific numbers are but uh, you know those algorithms only show a certain percentage of your audience um, uh, a post and those posts only live um, really for like 40 minutes and so um, uh, you know just kind of uh, you know as, as you see fit trying to pump out as many of those stories I think kind of help with the culture change of of acceptance like you were talking about more buy-in from from not only government agencies but um, the public as well as they see like these good examples of stories of of of, um, of uh, government um, servants, you know, doing good jobs. So thank you for for highlighting that. Um, that's really great. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Does anyone have any other questions or comments for Todd about Sunshine Week or anything related? No? Okay. Um, we will move to item B, uh, short session. So this would be in reference to um, Senate Bill 1506. Um, Todd, if you want to talk briefly about your lobbying experiences, and I'm also help happy to help um, fill in some of those blanks. Yeah, Stephanie, and actually, if you don't mind, I wouldn't mind you uh, kind of taking the lead on this discussion only because as you know, chair of the PRAC, I deferred to your lead as it was the PRAC bill that we were promoting and you actually were able to attend some meetings that I wasn't able to. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, would, I would love to hear your take on this. And definitely what occurred in the session was important in part because it bolstered some thoughts I had about what changes might be needed to the PRAC bill granting the, uh, granting the Advocates Office independence. So I could speak to that, but I'd really, really like you to take it away first for the overview. 
Sure, no problem. So um, this was my first session um, advocating for a bill. Um, and so I had a lot of help from Andrea, our legislative director. And um, Andrea, feel free to chime in on anything that I'm missing. Um, but the way that we carried it out is we um, created the, the one-page summary document. We circulated that to the Senate um, committee members. Um, we diligently tracked, attempted to track every movement of that committee um, to try to figure out as soon as as soon as we could um, when they were going to be holding a hearing and a work session and all that stuff. Um, so we were tracking that, and then we did end up reaching out. Andrea reached out to each committee member to set up meetings for um, uh, Todd, myself, Andrea, whichever combination of the three of us could make it. Um, to meet with each committee member, present the one pager and, and ask them, you know, what questions or concerns did they have um, and talk briefly about the PRAC and the bill and the advocate's office. So we did that um, with everyone who had time to meet with us. And then I went in person and testified. Um, hopefully you were, were all able to view that um, either when it was happening or after the fact. Um, I tried to do you proud um, and speak for um, the PRAC's best interest, and it seemed to go really well. It went, it had a unanimous in favor vote in the Senate and had moved over to the House. I was doing a repeat performance for the House committee, um, and they moved it through, and it was kind of stuck on the floor um, when the, it didn't get to the floor, basically, when the walkout happened. So um, I think for all intents and purposes, we did a good job. We um, answered the questions that needed to be answered and, and um, advocated as much as we could. And I think it just was a casualty of um, the session being cut short. But I think otherwise it would have been successful. Um, Andrea, what am I missing? I, I think you covered pretty much everything. <laughs> you did a really good job testifying, too. Oh, thank you. Ah. Um, we yeah, did have. Yeah, I would. I would. Go ahead. No, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say we did have other people come and testify um, that I that I didn't know what. So um, thank you to Senator Thatcher for doing so. Um, and uh, yeah, we had a lot of support, so that was really helpful. Um, what were you going to say, Todd? I was just going to say I echo everything you said, and I also wanted to extend my own thanks to you as well. I think you, you know, you stepped into this position. <laughs> kind of uh, quickly and unexpectedly, and you've really risen to the occasion. And I think you did a great work of just advancing the interests of the PRAC and supporting the office and its move for independence. And I don't think we could have had a better advocate doing this work, both in your meetings with the senators and in your testimony at the legislature. So I just want to say how grateful I am to have you as, a, as part of this effort. And this is uh, Mark Landauer. I would like to just uh, echo all those comments and also um, particularly thank both Senators Thatcher and Representative Power for giving us the opportunity to make the case in the first place. They were able to convince uh, Senator Riley, who was the chair of the Oversight Policy Committee that received the bill, I believe it's the Senate general government uh, committee and were able to convince him to hear the bill which really uh, assisted us in getting that thing moving and would agree with all the comments that it really was simply a casualty of the circumstances rather than a casualty of policy. Um, this is Steve so I I want to echo all of that. Um, Stephanie, I think you did a great job. Um, and um, I guess I just wanted to extend, expand the circle of, uh, of um, kudos to Mark as well. I heard him testify. Also heard um, Rob, I uh, believe I heard Rob testify as well. And I caught uh, Senator Thatcher's uh, speech carrying the bill on the floor. And um, I thought it was, I mean, it was great. I, I think it really uh, captured, it, you know, presented a, a very united front. And um, I think all of that contributed to the ease of passage through both chambers, um, at least as far as it went. And um, I don't know, I guess I, I'd be interested in hearing Mark and from uh, Senator Thatcher, if you're on the line, whether 
we talked about this at the last meeting, but you know, just the fact that it sailed through so easily, whether that gives any, you know, credence to gives us ammunition to to make the case to the Senate President and the House Speaker that um, that that should be allowed forward again, even in a special session. This is Senator Thatcher. I absolutely think you have um, a mandate there. Whether it would go forward during a special session is a little iffy since everybody's focused on COVID and wanting to make sure we don't just open it up to all topics because there's a lot of worry surrounding that as well. So um, definitely a 2021 um, bill that I think would sail through easily. And this is Mark. I 100% I agree with uh, the senator. Um, this isn't a special session item. There are lives at stake, livelihoods at stake. Um, those issues take uh, a front seat to uh, this particular issue, although I, I realize we would all like to get this done sooner rather than later. There are um, a lot of exigent um, issues going on both for the state as well as local governments right now. And, and I hate to say it, but this just isn't one of those at this time and agree with Senator Thatcher that this is a 2021 issue. Yeah, I, I get that. I, I just bring it up. I think it was Rob who brought it up at our last meeting as, you know, a long shot, but maybe something, maybe it's something that'd be part of a larger, you know, omnibus agreement. I, I, Steve, I, I just personally, I don't see that happening. Um, not, not, uh, not at this time. We're hearing that the next, uh, the soonest special or emergency session that will take place is probably in June after the May forecast. That's going to be uh, an exercise of fixing budgets that are, um, as the governor has termed it, cratered. Um, we won't know the extent of the um, damage until May 20th, as many of you know, but um, this is going to be an all hands on deck uh, to try to set the various budgets uh, in line with the budget realities that we're going to be facing, um, not only this summer, but but for probably years to come. Excuse me, uh, this is Scott Winkles. I'm joining the call. Sorry, I'm late. Hi, Scott. Thank you for joining. Welcome. Uh, this is this is Tony. I have a question. Sure. Um, speaking speaking of budgets, um, and this is just my my uh, lack of um, knowledge of, of state processes, but um, so my, with sort sessions being ideally for for budget purposes, um, was how, how you know now that we're two years into to having um, the, the public records off. Uh, advocate office how is our budget looking um at, uh, in, in, is there enough was there enough support going into this and and is there going to be any concern um uh just kind of following up on what mark said like how how where, how will that impact a, a in government sorry that was a very jumbled question but i hope that makes sense I think Todd, this is Mark. I think Todd should handle that um, because, again, we won't know the revenue forecast until May 20th, at which point we will have a number to go after. Um, I suspect, though, that, that Todd, in an acting capacity, has some staff savings um, that they can probably uh, avoid any serious cuts. But, Todd, I, I leave that to you. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, there's certainly only ambiguity until the revenue forecast. Uh, but yes, there's definitely been uh, personnel cost savings with Ginger's departure and then my movement into the acting role, because certainly then uh, there's one salary that's gone unpaid. And then with all, uh, with all the response to COVID-19, I am not traveling and incurring other expenses as well. So certainly for the remainder of this biety in the office is fine. 
uh, after the budget forecast, I think that will help us understand how we're doing moving into the next biennium. And of course, there's a lot of variables at play too. For instance, the, I still desire to move the office to a location outside of archives that allows it to have, I should we call it structural and administrative independence to further this goal of overall agency independence. But that does cost money. <clears throat> and as you know, I had attempted to move the office previously, and that's now been stalled uh, uh, in part because of the, our response to the virus. But the goal in doing that was to build a business case uh, to demonstrate to the legislature why appropriate funding increases are necessary to meet the office needs for space and, you know, tech support and anything else that goes into running your own office. So really, at this point, everything is in a holding pattern. And we are realizing savings, but moving forward, I'm not sure what we can put into play until we know how much money will be there. And then, of course, there's even other variables, like, for instance, if I'm fortunate enough to become advocate, then I move into that position, but then perhaps I won't be, be able to hire a deputy behind me. Or if someone else is selected as advocate and I return to my deputy role, then we're back to paying two salaries. And how does that impact the ability of either one of us to travel? to fulfill our mandate. So everything at this point is an open question, and I've certainly received nothing uh, but support from those I've worked with, and as most, most especially um, at DAS, Brian DeForest shop, under the COO where our budget lives. Uh, I've, but I've had conversations with LFO and others, and everyone's very open to the concepts that we want to enact, but no one can obviously give any guarantees at this point. And we're in nothing but a wait and see posture at this point. Yeah, thank you. That was excellent. I appreciate that. I was I was um, definitely curious about the uh, potential uh, move to another uh, location and the impact of, of the, <clears throat> the the virus. Obviously, thinking that all that was going to be put on 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 hold. But um, but yeah, thank you for for doing all that work. Appreciate the update. Yeah, sure, of course. I will just add. I had I uh, had been in conversations with Das and. Uh, potentially selected a new location because the initially the house that uh, I was I was going to move the office to uh, the historical homes in the across from archives ultimately proved perhaps not cost effective for an office that might not grow beyond two people for a long time and it seemed easier to perhaps start with a, a smaller location and so uh, DAS East had space available and we were in discussions about their ability to make it available through the end of this biennium as we build a business case to either stay in that location or move somewhere else. But again, uh, that all did have to pause because if, if the virus hadn't happened, there's a good chance the office would already be in that other location. So yeah, that's, that's where we're at at the moment. Thanks for the question. Thank you. So any more questions for Todd about um, budget or um, short session? No. Okay, well, I think we're ready to move along to um, the discussion of Todd's draft legislative concept. I will pull it up on the screen for those of you who are able to um, be at a computer right now. Let's see. Draft RS. I think this is right. So those at a screen can see this, those on the phone, um, hope you can follow along. <laughs> um, so Todd, do you wanna walk us through um, some of your thinking behind kind of each section and we can discuss? Yeah, sure, Stephanie. First, I'll just give a quick overview and then I'll dive into each of these. But essentially what my suggestions here break down into two categories, one is Completing what was started by SB 1506, but I think from the feedback I received requires additional detail to execute the idea of an independent office. This is incredibly important to get it down in the law that the office exists as an independent state agency within the executive branch. But there were things left in the old bill or in the old statute and things left unsaid that didn't completely untether the office the way I believe the PRAC wanted it to and had to occur for that to happen. So I'll walk through those. And then the, uh, the second area of changes just furthers discussions that Ginger and I had pretty much from day one and that I still believe are necessary to further building an office structure, making um, operations more 
mainline, more in line with the rest of state government when it comes to daily functionality and continuity of operations when the advocate position is vacant. So having said that, I'll just go to my draft and walk you through it. So the first suggested change I have is in subsection one, and this is just an, some alternative language to offer to the PRAC to consider. I realize, of course, that anything the PRAC does is still subject to legislative counsel using their own language, which happened with, of course, uh, the PRAC bill that became SB 1506. The, hey, uh, hey, the light. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry, Todd. This is Mark Landauer, and I just want to be sure that I'm understanding and, and following you correctly. Is this, frankly, a, just basically a copy of 1506 with your, uh, with your uh, suggested modifications? Yes and no. Uh, essentially what it is, is it's um, some original edits I suggested to Ginger that I've tweaked and since then also plugged in the relevant language from 1506. So it's actually ORS 192.461. So representing pretty much everything I think that was in 1506 and then my suggested changes as well. It looks like you have in the comments where, you, where you've diverged from 1506, like that first one, right, Todd? Mm -hmm. Oh yes, for everything that is mine is accompanied by a comment to show that it's mine. And so if anything that's from 1506, I didn't necessarily highlight within this section, even if it's in there. I'm sorry if that's confusing. Okay, I'm not hearing <laughs> any grumbling in response, so I will continue but feel free to ask me more questions as I go. So the first one again, of course, the original, <clears throat> excuse me, language from 1506 says the Office of the Public Records Advocate is created as an independent office in the executive department. Very clear and straightforward. I've just always particularly favored the long-term care ombudsman language, which occupies a similar or satisfies a similar feature in state government in saying that the public records advocate shall function separately and independently from any other state agency. That's just alternative language I would like to suggest to the PRAC, but again, LC could do what they want, regardless of which direction the PRAC chooses to go in. And of course, LC has already given us language for this section that they might choose to stick with. I just think it really directly and concisely addresses how the office exists within the executive department as its own state agency. Okay, if there's no questions about that comment, I'll move to the next one. And actually the next comment about the advocate uh, existing in the exempt service as opposed to the unclassified is something the PRAC has actually already addressed and I believe made it into SB 1506. So we'll just be making sure that that change is not lost in the shuffle because that speaks to a governor's appointee who is hired or can only be terminated for cause as opposed to being an at-will appointee. So it's just necessary to make sure that language is maintained. The next section is uh, some ideas that uh, I've been kicking around since I came to the office that again, just really helps establish that the advocate is not only a person who exists in this sort of ombudsman role looking outward, but they wear an additional hat of an agency director where they have to administrate it, administrate inwardly towards staffing levels and things of that nature. And I just think it's important to have that spelled out because it just further dispels any confusion about what the office is, where it lives in state government and how it should be recognized vis-a-vis -vis other agencies when we're interacting with them. Because one thing I've experienced is people don't necessarily understand who I am when I'm calling in my advocate role and who I am representing. And you know, this is just structural behind the scenes changes that would support the advocate contacting them as in part an agency director. The next section, which is uh, would be 8A, says that uh, the deputy public records advocate shall be a member in good standing of the Oregon State Bar. This is important in part because of what occurred at the time of Ginger's departure. Fortunately, I was an attorney and was able to move into uh, the acting advocate's role uh, and to fill those shoes while uh, you know their uh, replacement is being looked for. But I don't know 
if that would have been possible had I not been an attorney admitted to the Oregon State Bar. And again, if the office is formalizing into a proper, you call it a proper state structure, <clears throat> I think to have a true deputy, a deputy needs to be able to stand in the place of their director as necessary and would need to be an attorney. Moving down to, oh, Section 8B is just, uh, just the company's 8A and essentially says what a deputy should be able to do, which is whatever roles are delegated to it by the director or the advocate. And then Section 8C would just address the confusing situation that occurred not only when Ginger resigned, but also when she went on maternity leave about would I uh, be given an out-of-class um, change Sorry, right, I'm not thinking of the correct terminology right now. But would I be permitted to work out of class? Can I move into an acting role? Who gets to designate that and what is the process to do so? As some of you might know, uh, it took a very long time to make that happen. And even though it happened while Ginger was on maternity leave, when she departed, it got even more confusing because people weren't sure, is this the same kind of out of class work, acting type position, is there something new? Who has the power to uh, direct or appoint an acting advocate? And it just really led to this long period of confusion where, of course, I was there and I was doing all the work. It was in this kind of air of ambiguity where I wasn't sure what role I was actually occupying. And it just, I think it would just eliminate a lot of confusion and the notion of reinventing the wheel every time an advocate, you know, departed or moved on to another position. Uh, and then in the next section, which uh, is all crossed out, this removes the language that says the state archivist furnishes office facilities and provides administrative support to the advocate. And if that is not possible, then DAS takes up that role. This, is, this was relayed to me time and again by uh, multiple knowledgeable individuals that this needs to be eliminated if in fact the office is going to be independent. And that makes perfect sense because of course the state agency stands on its own, generally does not receive this kind of support from other public bodies unless it's through uh, interagency agreements, which our office would most likely want to execute probably with DAS for contractual services like IT, HR, payroll, et cetera, but it's just not automatically granted to an independent state agency and uh, most likely would have required a separate bill if 1506 had passed in the next session to then eliminate this language as well and remove any confusion. And then finally, um, what is now section nine establishes the office the office's budget as its own dedicated uh, line item from the general fund this so the the statute that currently exists that lays out the structure of the office is the dash 17 amendment to sb 106 from was that 2017 that created the office well up until the dash 16 amendment or up through the Dash 16 Amendment, the office did have its own line item funding like this. And there's actually testimony from Emily Matazar that this Dash 16 Amendment came about through uh, intensive negotiation from the governor's office with all stakeholders and that they fully supported it. And so I don't know what caused the change that led to the Dash 17 Amendment that ultimately placed the budget of the office under the COO, but it seemed like there was a lot of support for making this happen. And of course, this was something else that was suggested to me would require another bill if 1506 had passed and to just take the spending authority away from DAS to reduce its limitations since they would no longer hold the advocate's budget. And in fact, move that money over into a fund specifically for the public records advocate. So this is intended to do all in one bill, but would have had to most likely have occurred over two bills, or at least that's how I understand it as it's been explained to me. And of course, many of you were involved in the creation of the office. I know we have Adam on the phone from DAS. And so uh, perhaps some of you can speak to this more fully than me, but this is essentially what I've been able to assimilate from all sources and put into one location to, I hope, complete the work that the PRAC started in moving the office towards independence. So I'm open to grumbling or questions now. Okay, thank you, Todd. Um, who has well, questions for Todd? or comments about any of this? Um, I, I, yes, this, is, yeah, yeah. this is this is Mark Landauer. Adam, um, I'd be curious about uh, if, if 
whoever's controlling the uh, <laughs> the draft here, can you please scroll to the bottom? Mm -hmm. I'm interested in your new section nine here. I personally don't necessarily have any grumbling, but I would be curious to know what the take is from Das and Adam on removing this from uh, DAS's budget. Is, is that problematic? Um, it's sort of unusual. I haven't, I suppose there are a few offices out there that are, there that are similar, but I'd just be curious what DAS's perspective is on that. Sure. Uh, hey, everybody, this is Adam Crawford, uh, first time member of the PRAC. I'm the government relations guy for the Department of Administrative Services. Uh, my understanding is the, the direction the PRAC would like to go is to separate from DAS. Um, as a result, I think whether you're talking your own uh, fund or a general, appropriate, uh, general fund appropriation or some other way, I, I think is going to be necessary to, to complete that goal. Otherwise, you will ultimately be under our budgetary authority. Um, the second thing I was hoping I might be able to speak to is uh, a sub seven. Uh, I understand there's a desire for uh, the public records advocate to shall select, appoint, and fix the compensation um, of the deputy as well as any other folks within the public records advocate office. Um, I would encourage you to think about just exempting yourselves completely from ORS 240. Uh, ORS 240 is the chapter that deals with classification and compensation. Um, there's some pretty set rules uh, guiding a lot of that about what a public service, public servant otherwise should, should and will get paid. Um, those are governed through DAS. Um, that's an authority given to DAS. However, I would mo mention that statewide electeds and certain um, specialty organizations are exempted from ORS 240. Uh, given kind of everything that's occurred here, I might suggest you do that here as well, just to make sure there's no ambiguity about who, uh, who otherwise sets compensation. If you do exempt yourself from ORS 240, at that point, compensation is a conversation between the, this office and the legislature and what budget it otherwise gives you. Great, thank you, Adam. That's helpful. Hey, Adam, if you don't, if Stephanie, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask Adam a question about his comment. Please. Adam, do you think it would be better to augment that section with mention of 240, something akin to what was in your uh, legislative concept, or to replace the section entirely with, a, with just some mention about being exempted from 240? I think you could augment it. I think just, you know, belt and suspenders, leaving that section in there, as well as just adding the, the exemption to 240, maybe in a new sub eight or somewhere else in the document. I think what you've got here, you know, clearly speaks to the powers that the public records advocate have. Um, and I think just by adding that, you know, one line for an exemption, I think you clear up a lot of issues. Okay, thank you. And I might, if you don't mind, run it, any draft language I have by you before um, we suggest being or sending it to Stephanie for consideration by the PRAC. Happy, happy to look at it. Thank you. Uh, um, I, could I ask another question? This is Mark Landauer, and I apologize, but um, I, I'm working with a number of other state age executive agencies right now who are all working on their legislative concepts for 2021, as well as their uh, what we call policy option packages. Good luck on that for those of you who know what those are. Um, those are basically um, requests for additional funding uh, for expanded or new services. Um, my question is taught to direct it, I guess, to Todd. Uh, Todd, understanding that you're um, an independent entity, assuming that this were would have passed, um, are you having to submit this to DAS for their consideration? Uh, considering that 1506 did not pass, 
I'd like I'd like to have some clarity, if I may, on what process you are having to pursue in order to get uh, something similar to 1506 introduced, or are we planning on asking Thatcher representative power or both of them to uh, introduce this uh, independently of the DAS governor's process? Thank you. Um, I'll take this one, Todd, since you were not part of our last meeting. This is Stephanie. Um, so, Mark, yes, uh, Senator Thatcher did speak up at our last PRAC meeting and um, has offered to carry um, whatever bill we're ready to present um, that way, like last time. Um, we did have a DAS uh, placeholder bill just in case. Um, it sounds like we most likely won't need that one. Um, so we had been exploring multiple options um, through DAS, through Secretary of State's office, and then um, through our, our friends from the legislature on the PRAC. And it sounds like Senator Thatcher is able to um, help us out with that again and um, possibly representative power, but I, I have not confirmed that yet. And if I could just add one thing, Stephanie. Yes, please. So my, my suggested additions or changes, or if you want to call it entirely new bill here, are meant only to support the PRAX work. And yes, uh, I'm grateful for, to DAS for having a placeholder bill to preserve that route for the PRAC. But my only goal here is to inform the PRAC and then support whatever decision the PRAC makes. So whichever route the PRAC intends to go in terms of submitting a bill, that is the route I will support 100%. And not utilize the other route. So if the PRAC ultimately goes through Senator Thatcher, you know, then that would be it, in my opinion, at least for uh, the DAS placeholder bill. And I would not pursue an alternative bill through them. I would just continue to work to support the PRAC along whatever route it chose to go. Thank you. That's very helpful. I, I just want to note for the council that um, a legislative concepts are due to legislative council on September 25th. Okay, so that's a really important deadline uh, for us to keep in mind as we move forward and sort of uh, fine tune what it is we ultimately decide to um, uh, introduce and what pathway we choose to pursue. Um, I, I wanted to also speak to, I can't, I can't quite read the notation, but it's the, it's the new paragraph about, uh, about a separate fund. Um, and you know, we've discussed this, uh, in the past a number of times, and I, I think there are a number of people have expressed support for the idea of a dedicated funding mechanism potentially patterned off for, off the government ethics commission. Um, and I guess, and I certainly would count myself among the supporters of exploring that idea. Um, so I guess my question is sort of tactically for the group, um, whether, you know, th this is a, this is a new concept that was not in 1506. Um, it, it was, it was in the original bill in 2017. I, uh, that's, that's a useful, uh, piece of background, Todd. Um, I'm just wondering whether it makes sense to pursue that all in one place here or whether we should have a separate, uh, a separate funding bill or, you know, funding mechanism bill. Um, you know, I guess if there's consensus on this, then uh, and we can include it here. That's great. And maybe it takes care of it all, one, it all in one swoop. But um, I guess my other worry is if there's no separate bill, to spell out a specific funding mechanism, this passes as written. Um, do we suddenly lose the the general fund revenue stream without without anything to replace it? Um, I don't know. W welcome anybody's thoughts on that. Well, don't everybody just jump in, <laughs> Mark? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, it's a great question, Steve. And as you recall, uh, it was probably what, how, how long ago was it? A year and a half ago, I committed to the council that I'd be willing to explore dedicated funding sources. 
for the PRAC or for the PRA, I should say. And, and I still maintain that sentiment. Um, but, but I think that we're sort of in extraordinary, I think we can all agree we're in extraordinary times right now. And uh, my commitment to having that discussion is uh, still rock solid, Steve. I think that our timing is really bad right now to pursue that. I think with the language that Todd has um, uh, sort of introduced here, um, I think it's the first step towards creating an, uh, potentially an independent funding uh, process. Um, what what I, I think I understand what Todd is doing, and, and that is creating a separate account uh, completely distinct from the general fund for the purposes of the public records advocate and its administration operations, so on and so forth. That doesn't preclude or diminish our ability to uh, discuss a way to independently fund the PRA. And as a matter of fact, establishing a public records advocate fund that would already be in statute would be one of the things we would have to do anyway if we created an independent funding mechanism. So in, in my view, this is one step closer towards uh, your sort of stated goal of independently funding the, uh, the office. Now, uh, there's still a lot of work that we're gonna have to do in, in sort of identifying how we could potentially independently fund it like the Government Ethics Commission. But in my view, this is a step in that direction and I'll shut up at this point. That sounds good to me, Mark. I, I just wondered whether, technically speaking, you know, if you create this fund, this separate and distinct from the general fund, I mean, I guess there's nothing to stop the legislature from continuing to pour general fund money into this separate and distinct fund. That that would be my take. Okay. And it's, it's Todd again, if I could just add, well, Mark, first of all, thank you for uh, how you presented that. I think that was uh, pretty spot on and summed it up better than I could. Really, what, the reason I put this language here is it's actually more looking back than forward, because if the office is created or now made independent, simply by saying that in a statute, it would exist independent, independently in name only because its budget would still be attached to DAS COO and would have to be moved out somehow. So my only goal was making actual what would be implied through that language. And then, like you said, having it ready done as an interim step to whatever the office wants to do in the future or the PRAC to address funding. This would at least get us out on our own and get us started. Of course, we're still subject to the legislative process for the budget, but it would now be the advocate going to the legislature on its own rather than being part of DAS's presentation for their budget. Oh, this is Tony. Um, I think that uh, Todd, thanks for adding in um, your suggestions, especially uh, looking back, like you said, um, especially if you're having trouble or not having trouble, but um, um, when you know if, if people are you know if it's hard to show in law the independent nature of of, of the uh, of the pra um i guess and, and i understand it's bad timing uh thanks mark for explaining the context and um steve the question but uh i do wonder um you know after taking if, if we're successful with this change um and moving it over to general fund <clears throat> and then somehow getting a independent funding um stream uh how this looks um uh, it, you know moving forward uh, if if there's any additional language that needs to be put in there um for growth um since this is kind of uh just looking at a uh, like the ethics commission but if, if just i guess i'm wondering since i'm hearing there's 145 people that were interested before the pandemic in attending an event um, and, and there's a general public interest uh, in, in our interest from uh, agencies for training um, and th there needs to be any kind of growth um, if that language needs to, if we need to start thinking about that language maybe that's a 2022 thing 
um, but I was just kind of wondering if, if any thought has been put to that. You know, Tony, I did have some thought about that, and that's why I did kind of beef up the language about the public records advocate selecting, appointing, and fixing the compensation of a person as deputy and then for other positions as well, because growth is envisioned for the office. To speak to, I think, Mark's point earlier, I was working with DAS on a POP for two additional FTE to be funded in the next biennium, which, of course, now is up in the air and perhaps unlikely. But I think by establishing a standardized agency structure, again, where you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time something new occurs, there was room for growth with a kind of more recognizable agency director and deputy at the top, and then the ability to delegate authority as needed and hire new people as needed. So I did, that was the kind of the focus of the middle portion of my changes here in sections seven and eight, but I, I would love to hear uh, if anyone else or offer to the PRAC, of course, to debate as needed if they think other language is necessary in response to what you're saying to make sure that continual growth is possible without constantly having to go back to the legislature for new language, because that is, of course, the best outcome. Yeah, hey, hey, Todd, yeah. Todd, I just I just looked at your language again, and you know I'm not an attorney. I don't play one on TV, uh, but uh, on under 8C, it seems to me that um, if the position of public records advocate becomes vacant for any reason, the deputy public records advocate shall serve as the acting PRA until a new public records advocate has been appointed for a full term. Are we saying that, and if my memory serves me correctly, a the PRA's term is a four-year term. Are you um, suggesting that the new PR, you're saying, you're making a policy decision that the new PRA is in for a full four-year term rather than fulfilling the, the remainder of the previous PRA's ter, uh, term. Can you um, perhaps explain that one a little bit to us? Sure, Mark, and I, I'll, I'll uh, confess I did not give that deep thought, but the fact that the existing statute already refers to uh, the hiring process for a new advocate when the position is vacant, and it, it's the exact same process as when the initial advocate was hired, which is the council picks three members, one member goes to the governor, or, or three uh, candidates rather, those candidates go to the governor to select one name who's then confirmed by the Senate, and then the statute just goes on, just, just keeps the original language about an advocate serves four years. I, yeah, I saw that as essentially meaning that each new advocate hired gets a four-year term, and there was nothing either expressed or implied about the new advocate completing the former advocate's term, term first. I saw that as a complete restart each time a new advocate is hired. So I just didn't see anything in the language that led me to think what you just suggested, although I don't think that's an unreasonable interpretation or possibility, it just hadn't occurred to me, honestly, because I didn't see any sort of implication or suggestion of that in the statute, so it never occurred in my mind as an alternative. I'm fine with it, I just wanted to ask. Yeah, fair enough, and thank you, because uh, now I'm looking at it differently, but I still, I still hold to my belief that my original interpretation is the strongest, and I not aware of anything that would lead me to now think otherwise, but I do see why you could think that. And thank you for that perspective. Okay, I see Les Zeitz has joined us. Hello, Les. Uh, we are talking. Good afternoon. <laughs> nice to hear your voice. We are talking about a draft legislative concept proposed by Todd Albert. He's been walking us through some of the sections here. Um, and then Tony, did you have a question or a comment? Uh, no, I think uh, it was answered um, just a minute ago. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tony. Does anyone else have any questions or comments for Todd um, regarding any of these suggested changes? No. Okay. Well, I don't feel like we're ready for a vote today. Um, does anyone? Um, feel differently? I think we 
I think we still have some things to uh, work through here um, before we have uh, a, a draft ready um, for folks to vote on. Um, does that sound reasonable? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I wonder if this is something we can just add on to during um, one of the interview meetings or because or, thinking of the, the September uh, deadline that Mark mentioned. Yeah, I think what I'll do, Tony, is schedule another meeting um, between probably, okay. um, probably between uh, the recruitment meetings um, because I definitely don't want to mix mix this business with the recruitment business. Um, so we'll make okay. that a distinct okay. meeting. Um, does anyone have anything else for the good of the order today? Uh, yeah, sorry, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. um, so have we gotten more resumes? Uh, Steve, let's talk about that um, during the uh, next recruitment call. Um, uh, yeah. Today is not about recruitment, so we'll we'll save that for another day. And also, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. So. Can you and remind me when, when is that next call? Um, that I believe is after the recruitment closes, um, and that's going to be, I believe, May twenty eighth. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, but I will send um, update emails as I receive updates after the recruitment closes. So. And you'll be hearing uh, more information from me on all of that. Um, does anyone have anything else today? I just, it's Emily. I just want to encourage people to share the job announcement as widely as possible. I've tried to do that in my circles. And thanks, Steve, for helping with some clarifying information. Um, and I've tried to do that nationally as well as locally. So I would just encourage people to really push it out. We've got, there's two more weeks in the application window. Okay. Thank you, Emily. Um, do we have a motion to adjourn the meeting today? So moved. Second. Thank you. All those in favor of adjourning? Aye. 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 And the opposed? All right. I'm adjourning the Public Records Advisory Council meeting for April 29th. Thank you all. Stay safe. Thank you, Stephanie. Take care, everybody.